Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in today to this episode of the Referology series. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mayan, for being with us today. Um, so today we'll be talking about uh, eosinophilia. Um, eosinophilia is one of those conditions that I feel aren't really, isn't very well taught in medical school. And um, it's one of those things where we may have a bit of an idea about, like, um, okay, we know it's associated with certain infections, certain allergies. But I think many of us don't really have a very systematic approach to it. So hopefully you can um, help guide us along today uh, when faced with uh, eosinophilia. So the first question is, um, what are the causes of eosinophilia? And I sort of tried to think of it in terms of like a stable patient, like incidentally noted eosinophilia, versus someone who comes in quite sick and we note eos eosinophilia. So what's your approach to this uh, phenomenon? Okay, so it's a very tall order to decipher eosinophilia because I think the one thing is that the causes are very, very diverse. Mm. So if uh, you look at a differential list, right, it's really very, very long. So I think the key is that most causes of eosinophilia is actually reactive. So they are secondary etiologies and that takes up the bulk of the conditions. Mm. Now, I just wanted to highlight a few of the conditions that perhaps are a little bit more critical and yep. hence should have a little bit more of a, like when you're actually approaching a patient, think about it because obviously if you don't think about it, you're unlikely to actually ask questions and investigation to direct towards these etiologies. So yep. I think one thing is more of the autoimmune, you know, vasculitic uh, condition. So like church shrouds, mm. uh, your pants and SLE. Uh, and then your more severe drug reactions such as dress, like obviously can, they can have very, very severe uh, consequences. I mean, parasitic infections, I think everybody is very, very aware of their atopic conditions as well. Everybody is very aware and everybody is very fascinated by primary hematological eosinophilia, yep. which honestly is very, very rare. Um, okay. But that being said, there are some conditions within this category where uh, perhaps it's also very hard for even hematologists to diagnose For example, like say systemic mastocytosis is something that uh, commonly is very hard to uh, diagnose and if you don't think about it you will not find it because the diagnostic workup is also very different i see yeah so um when when is it that we would need to start thinking whether it's a primary hematological cause and get a hematological uh, hemo hematology opinion i think the first thing to really think about is i think this falls into the second part of the question which is Hmm. Uh, like when is eosinophilia significant, right? Yep. So in this aspect, right, um, most eosinophilias are mild. You're okay. talking about levels of like more than 0.5, but perhaps like less than 1.5. Okay. And these levels, I mean, honestly, that being aside, significance also is whether there's eosinophilic and organ damage. So yep. end organ damage, like cardiac, for example, presenting with heart failure or neurological, whether it's like uh, peripheral neuropathy symptoms or CNS. And venous thromboembolism actually is a manifestation of uh, inusphilic and organ damage as well. So okay. when you have people with those type of uh, manifestations, yes, it still can be a reactive, but then it also raises our eyebrows to think whether this may be a clonal or primary hematological condition as well. So I really think okay. it's mainly the awareness, which I think not everybody is very aware of, of the inusphilic and organ damage syndromes that would necessitate, I would say, hematological input straight away. I see. So mm -hmm. if I may summarize, there is the element of the level, but that's not absolute also. But if it's mm -hmm. very high, yeah. then you think about it. And secondly, uh, looking for an organ involvement. Yeah. I um, think one thing to yep. mention is that your level and the end organ damage is not really correlatory. So for example, okay. a very, very high level like or absolute count like 20, you may have no end organ damage, but you know, levels of like two, you may already have end organ damage. So this is where your clinical assessment is extremely important. Now. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've noticed sometimes also in patients who, had, who have had multiple FBCs in the same admission, sometimes the eosinophilia is a bit high, then after it's normal, then it's high, then it's normal. So um, when, when, when is this something that, that happens commonly and how do we make sense of that? I mean, I always tell people that we are not robots. Like, you know, so we, we don't, your FBC on a daily basis will change and it's obviously dependent on the patient's clinical condition as well as what treatment that they have. So okay. for example, we, I will talk a little bit about management later on, but say for yeah. example, if you give a patient steroids, mm. your innocent account will drop no matter what the cause is. So, you know, things like that can affect the counts. But I would say really is looking for whether 
any of the patient's symptomatology may be significant for an organ. And like I said, if the levels are very high, then it warrants a hematological workup. And then that's where we work with the primary team to actually aid in the workup. Because missing, say for example, if everybody's con concerned, which is most of the time when they actually refer to us, is, is this a hematological problem? Is this a hematological malignancy? Yep. A lot of the times we end up picking many different conditions that actually has nothing to do with hematology, yep. but because we are aware of these reactive causes, and most of the time it's the autoimmune ones that I we see. do pick up. Yeah, and uh, that's where church trials can be devastating as well. Pen can be devastating as well. So, you know, this sort of condition has to be on your radar. Lah. Okay. Um, so that probably leads into the next question about mm. um, history, which you've mentioned the causes, and I guess yeah. that there'll be a strong link between that. But mm. what are some of the key things to highlight when you review someone with uh, eosinophilia? I think the one thing you really think about eosinophilia is really that the end organ manifestations and like say manifestations of the reactive cause can overlap a lot. So take mm. for example, SLE. SLE affects every single part of the body, right? You yep. get GI, respiratory, cardiac, whatever you have, SLE can, can yes. present. At the same time, end organ damage. What are your organs? The same things. So, yes. you know, heart failure, GI symptoms. So then it becomes this mismatch of what is significant for an organ, what is significant for the condition. And I guess that's where you actually have to sort of tie the, the symptomatology together to see whether this is part of a bigger syndromic uh, condition, like an autoimmune condition, versus these are all manifestations of the immunosinophilia and we still haven't got to the crux of what the immunosinophilia is. Needless to say, uh, I think the, the most important thing is that if you pick up this type of concerning uh, symptoms, right, uh, those are red flags for you to actually get treatment in early, get the workup done early as well. Okay. So I think in terms of like the directed history approach, I mean, apart from all your end organs, so really a whole systemic review is important. I think the other thing is the drug history because yep. I think sometimes when you're dealing with the dress, for example, it's a delayed immune reaction, right? Yep. So because of that, uh, drugs that were taken two, four weeks before may be missed. And once you bring dermatology in, they will give you a very nice drug chart. But um, you know, we're not supposed to get them to do that for us and we yep. as clinicians should be doing that uh, for ourselves, for our patients. Also things like travel history, especially to uh, high-risk countries, as well as a history of the patient. So what we also realized is that uh, the elderly population, for example, uh, when there was kampongs and when there were more rural settings in Singapore, exposure to um, parasites were quite uh, common. And this yep. can lay dormant in a person for years and manifest in elderly age when they are immunocompromised. So sometimes that may also uh, be helpful. Um, but obviously, it is a very, very general history and then targeting to things when you actually pick it up along the way. And this is the same for the physical examination as well. Mm. I mean, a full systemic examination is important. I think, uh, once again, uh, being hematologist, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, yes, the, yep. the crux of it, but it is a very, very general approach once again. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so, in terms of investigations, I think uh, if let's say there are suggestive um, end organ symptoms, oftentimes mm. we'll be able to target down those end organ mm. involvement. Mm. But yeah. I think sometimes it comes to those patients where either they're asymptomatic, we instantly note the presence of eosinophilia, and the history mm. doesn't very revealing. Mm. So at that point in time, maybe we can stratify between those um, who are sort of like asymptomatic is asymptomatic incidental versus those with like an organ sick patients like what's your approach to investigating them yeah so i mean honestly those asymptomatic um mild ones right like yep. less than 1.5 uh, most of the time if you pick up some like possible etiology like atopy or whatever mm. um you know or they are completely asymptomatic no end organ damage nothing to suggest then monitoring time is actually the best uh, bet forward because a lot of the times maybe it will go away and uh, you avoid a lot of hefty uh, workup and uh, the cost and, and time that's involved. Okay. Now that being said, I would say a few basic investigations is the full blood count. And the full blood count, not only in looking at the innocent failure, but looking at the friends that they keep. 
looking at your other differential counts, looking at whether you have co-committed cytokinias, any of those will suggest perhaps there may be other uh, possible etiologies, and this can be both in the reactive as well as the primary hematological. Uh, preferred blood uh, uh, film will also be useful as well. Uh, what we do as a hematologist is when you actually look under the microscope, we are looking for, like, say, for example, any atypical cells like blast or atypical mm. lymphocytes or even mast cells, which is rare but can be seen, okay. uh, to suggest that this may be a hematological condition. La. So mm. those are very, very basic. And organ-wise, you know, your kidney function test, your liver function test, obviously, is important. Yep. And everything else is really directed, as you, you mentioned, to what possible etiology or, for example, an organ e uh, evaluation that we require to do. La. So for example, if I use cardiac, mm. so if the patient has some heart failure symptoms, for example, then we may choose to do a basic ECG first. Um, then sometimes an echocardiogram to see what the function of the heart is like. Yep. Um, sometimes even a cardiac MRI. So it really is a stepwise process and it's not um, you know, a full uh, all-size-fits uh, manual of investigations that we will do for, for all patients. Like it really is has to be tailored. So say, for example, if your etiology is not clear, Yep. Then, uh, say for example, um, if we think that um, this is fairly severe, maybe have some end organ, and I want to work up for uh, autoimmune vasculitic lesion, then you know your ANA, your double stranded ENA, your anchor investigation would then be warranted, yeah. Okay. And um, let's say I think currently because of the COVID situation in Singapore, we are seeing quite a few um, foreign workers who may be at high demographic risk for things like helminthic and parasitic infections. Um, I know this is sort of encroaching into sort of like ID uh, infectious disease space, la, but let's say a patient is referred to you for um, just eosinophilia. Um, do you tend to um, send the, the stool workup routinely, even if they're asymptomatic? And do for yourself, do you uh, practice empirical treatment for uh, anti-helminthics? Yeah, so uh, I mean, if for example, it's uh, asymptomatic and fairly high, yeah. Uh, I would. Okay. Um, and I mean, symptoms is only how much you dig into it. So if you dig deep enough, you may find some symptoms. Mm. Uh, so it's really, once again, the degree of uh, suspicion and then the approach to evaluation. Um, in terms of empirical treatment, yes, I do for, I mean, this is once again a case-by-case -case basis, but if the yep. innocent failure is quite high, I would. Mm. The other circumstance where I will do empirical treatment, for example, this patient does have indication to um, get some treatment, like say for example steroids, yep. you know that co-committed uh, infections can also occur. Um, so I would also give empirical antiparasitic treatment in those circumstances because I know if I give steroids, the parasitic infection can flare. Okay. So in those circumstances, we also will give empirical treatment. I see. And in, let's say it's like this group of patients, after you initiate treatment, um, what do you expect the trend of, do you expect it to come down within a few days, few weeks, few months? Oh, no, it's very fast. It will come very down in fast, few days. Huh? Yeah, few very, days. Very okay, yeah. okay. But obviously, if there's a secondary etiology, then really you must find out what that secondary etiology is because okay. that would be the main manifestation. Yeah, okay. but if you get the right, it's more or less things will them down. I see. Yeah. But you may not know the cause of, as in what exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think this slide, that the previous slide that, yep. that you were flashing was really about the more uh, advanced uh, hematology thing. And I, I keep getting questions about this. And honestly, mm. it's, very, it's fairly advanced and not familiar to, to most, uh, except for people who are in the hematology sphere. Yep. And I think the one thing that I want to emphasize is that it's still a very, very diverse group within prim primary hematological clonal disorders. There are a lot of different mutations that are associated with it. So there's no one size fit all test that we do because a lot of the times we get referrals to ask us, oh, can you do a test to find out whether this is a, is a, a primary hematological inosinophilic syndrome. And most of the time we do a PP, uh, PG, FRA1, uh, A, sorry, uh, test, but that only covers one of the many mutations that's involved as you can see in this table. And there are also other hematological issues that can be associated with immunosinophilia, but not directly the cause. So even things like common things like CML, for example, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia is associated with immunosinophilia. Some of the myelodysplastic syndromes are also associated with immunosinophilia. So for us, this one really, you all will need us to come on board because it then is 
really up to the hematologist's interpretation of the case to do the further investigations. Once again, these investigations are very expensive and things like bone marrows are not without its risk. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, anything you want to highlight in terms of this particular slide? Yeah, so I mean, this is about treatment. Mm. So I think one thing is that it's very important is that you have to treat the underlying etiology. The inosinophilia will go away for a while with steroids, but if the inosinophilia etiology is not addressed, it will come back again. Okay. Um, that being said, if the patient has an organ damage, right, then emergent treatment is required. So like mentioned, cardiac, neurological, venous thrombosis, all of this would warrant because if you don't treat, they may get worse and you don't want the patient to end up with like a massive heart failure or, or irreversible nerve damage. That would be quite bad. So once again, the main arm is treating with corticosteroids. We usually do about 0.5 to 1 milligram. And this is for a duration of time. Uh, you will see response fairly fast, but we need to do a slow taper after that. So that is fairly important. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, just a random question, because sometimes in the books they say um, adrenal insufficiency may be associated with eosinophilia. Is this something that you see commonly or not really? Mm, not, not, not really. really la. Okay. I mean, adrenal insufficiency due to something. Okay, so it's more yeah. of like the, the underlying cause itself may be associated with yeah. both eosinophilia. And, okay, got it. Uh, okay. Um, any take-home points for like junior doctors uh, in the wards when they see a eosinophilia? Mm -hmm. But sometimes you may get brushed aside. Okay, sure. <laughs> oh, next slide. Okay, sure. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So once again, etiology, 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 etiology. You know, cell failure like anemia is not a diagnosis. I, I okay. think we cannot emphasize that enough. And most of the time, the etiology is secondary more than primary. The okay. differentials are plenty, but you have to sort of tie tear it down. Mm. Look for end organ damage. I think end organ damage is something that a lot of people are not aware of. Okay. and uh, can be blindsided. So it's very important because that warrants emergent treatment. And mm. when in doubt, if you are confused, you know, just call us because we deal with this all the time. And most of the time, it will not end up being a hematological condition. Uh, but we are very happy to aid you in the workup because as you can see, it's really a lot of etiologies that can be fairly confusing for most. Okay, got it. Thank you very much.